having me on. Um, this is a pleasure. This is a, a nice, nice distraction from the everyday world. Well, we're, we're, we're officially live. So, so now, now we're officially live. And yes, this is the Comic Book Investing System podcast. And today, as obviously people caught in the past few weeks, I'm interviewing somebody who is in this space because, as I stated before, I do believe it is important to a break down comic news as well as and give commentary on it, but also talk to people who are comic book investors. And obviously I have Tom Fisher on. I think I think I got your name right, hopefully. And so I think the best place to start is that I think it's safe to say you are significantly older than me. So how did you get into comic collecting? Because everybody starts off as a collector and not a seller, in my experience at the very least. Uh, Andrew, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me on again. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks. I know that, uh, we had a glitch a couple of oh, weeks it, ago. It happens. It happens. It happens to everybody. No worries. But anyway, so, um, I got started, uh, probably at 11 or 12 years old. Um, and I think I was just re reading comic books. I enjoyed, uh, the whole aspect of riding my bike to the nearest drugstore where they had the, um, the comic book uh, rack and the magazine rack. And I remember um, going to comic book shows. My father would take me and my and my friends, who I also got interested in comic books. Uh, he would take us to these comic book shows where there would be like a room full of dealers, usually at like either a um, at a hotel or at a, a college um, university room where they had like a media room. And they would probably have 15 to 20 dealers. These were not large shows at the time. We're, we're going back to like the, probably the late 70s, somewhere around there, 78, 77. Um, and we would walk around the room and, you know, I'd pick out a couple books that I wanted. My father would would treat me to the books. They Back then they were, you know, I remember... I can actually remember walking through the room and looking at these large card tables that dealers would set up and they would put their books out on the card tables and they had like multiple copies of, I remember Captain America one. Now this is the silver age cap one, uh, silver surfer, um, submariner. Those were the books that were coming out at that, at that time. Uh, I, you know, the early bronze age marvels. Um, and they would sell for a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. And my friends and I would look at them and there would be 10, 15 copies of these books. And we would kind of snub our nose at those. We were interested in the Silver Age books. Um, Daredevil 1, Spider-Man 1, Spy you know, multiple issues of all the Spider-Man run. Uh, so that's how I got started. Just kind of, it just kind of happened. And so obviously the scene back in the day was very different and even the cultural to it and even what these books were, because obviously for those who don't know, and I think everybody sort of knows now in this space, is that you read comics, nobody thought that, A, there'd ever be a Cap movie, there'd be a Spider-Man movie there, you know, you read it and you didn't treat that stuff well. And so obviously, what was it like going through, because obviously you sort of caught, I guess, the back end of the Silver Age coming to the Bronze Age. Right. And what was all that like? Because because I am curious, because obviously I'm 28 and I came into comics when I was 12. And so that was, I think, like 2005, 2006 is when I came in in significantly different time period. So you're you're referring to um, actually when the movies first started? Yeah, so I came in like when the movies were first dropping and significantly different than the, the tail end of, of the silver age and the bronze age and even coming through all the way through that because comics were not the same as they are today and yeah. also they weren't you know comics if you go into a comic shop you're not going to get made fun of anymore in society for for the most part because right. comics are mainstream back in you know the early 80s not exactly you know the coolest thing to do um for me it was I remember uh, you're talking about like when Spider-Man first came out, the first Spider-Man, yeah. the, the Sam Raimi movie, um, the first Iron Man. I, I remember enjoying the movies. I don't think I paid much attention to the value of comic books at that point in time. 
my books were all put away. Um, and I became mostly, I had two key issues of Marvel books that I held on to. Um, a lot of the earlier books that I bought uh, when I was a teenager in my early 20s, I sold years before prior to that. And, and I remember, you know, I caught a little bit of appreciation on those books, but um, I remember the movies coming out. I didn't focus really on value. I enjoyed the characters. Um, I didn't start paying attention to comic book values probably for another 10 years after that. Um, and, so so, and so let, let's catch everybody up. 10 years after that puts us where? Exactly. 2017. Because obviously a lot has changed in, in comics. And this is what I kind of want to talk about. Because this is sort of how this all came about. Is that there was a big discussion in a group. And there's a whole big discussion. It's still going on. Where people are saying the market is too hot. People think it could keep going up. And obviously comics have been going up for a while. And I put something up, I think, in the same group where I actually broke down what Hulk 181 looks like from 1993 all the way to 2019 and what the average sale price has been in that time period, a 9.8 CGC graded. And it's actually not a good rate of return. For, for those who are interested, it's about 3.7% annualized, which is horrific. If you, if you really look at an annualization rate, 3.7% should not get anybody out of bed. And if it does, you need to reevaluate your investing. And I'm not an investment professional, but what was that like that sort of made you say, hey, wait a second, these books are getting hotter and there's a lot of desire and a lot of economic strife, I guess, for lack of a better word, there. Because I got into all this when I was in college and I needed beer money. And that's when I started realizing, oh, snap, this stuff has value. And I was, that's 2011, 2012, 2013, but nothing compared to, to those early silver age and late bronze, early bronze age as well. I, you know, I didn't, it didn't hit home for me until really, I would say probably two years ago. Um, you know, I've been, I've been busy uh, raising my family, um, working hard. Um, I have two two adult children that I'm, we're very involved as a family with. So I didn't really pay attention to it uh, until I would say two years ago. Um, I must have gone on eBay and I must have seen some of the the the, uh, the sales prices of the books. And I was blown away, like you said, Hulk 181. I couldn't believe that this Bronze Age book, which it looked like, you know, there were multiple copies available. Obviously, the higher grades would bring a lot more money. Um, I couldn't believe the values that these books were bringing, the sale prices. On, and, and and I kind of would go on Heritage. I'm, I'm a Heritage customer, so sometimes I'll check in with Heritage to see what's going on there. Um, I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. Uh, that's what kind of woke me up <clears throat> to pull out my collection. All my books, by the way, Andrew, were raw. All of my books were raw up until about a year and a half ago, two years ago. It was that that kind of encouraged me to start sending some books off to CGC. So, so, so there's a lot to talk about. So obviously... I think, and stop me at any point if you disagree, I think the market in comics has been slowly heating up for the last three, four years. And obviously, I think 2020 and even going into 2021 has forced a much higher heating up position. And there's a lot of reasons why. And so obviously, when you can't go to a bar, you can't go to a movie, you can't go to vacation, you know, everything, you're not going to your store anymore, you're not going to, to other events that happen when everybody's socially happening. It's not that everybody got a pay raise or everybody got their stimulus check for, you know, $1,800 or $2,400. It's the fact that everybody had maybe a little extra money, but a lot of your money that you were spending at the bar now is in your wallet. And so now you have more money to spend on a book and then people raise prices. And so that's what I think happened because books have skyrocketed in 2020 and even now they're pretty high. They've come down a little bit, 
But what do you think? Because the market, and we've had this discussion, obviously, in a Facebook group where people think that it could keep going up and up and up, and I think inflation is going to hit. And I think this is the first signs of it. So I'm curious about that, where you feel the current market is. I I think that... It's a little too rich, the market. Oh, absolutely. I, I... I, re- I recall actually a couple people on the Facebook group that we both participate in um, kind of poo pooed the whole idea. Well, they, I- they were making fun of me. I think they, they, they might have not gone after you the hard way, but some people were saying, like, I'm crazy and saying, oh, you could think that. And I was getting sort of attacked for not, not making me want to quit the group and nothing, you know, too severe, but people were really shooting it down. And I'm like, but if you look at because because I'm invested in the stock market as well, mm-hmm. and it's the idea that the stock market is at an all time high. It's unbelievable where it's going. And so that economics to me are very similar. So I, I'm curious about that. Sorry for cutting you off. Oh, that's OK. So, you know, <clears throat> it 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 reminds me what's going on now. I would call this almost a rational exuberance in the market the comic book market, kind of like what happened in the stock market. You know, I just feel my, my intuition or my guts telling me, like you, like you said, that values are getting ahead of themselves a lot. Um, when you've got people that are buying books one day and then trying to flip the same book, you know, a day or two days later or a week later, whatever, on eBay, it, it just reminds me of what happened in the housing market back in the uh, in the 2000s, 2007, 2008. It reminds me of the stock market where people were buying stocks and then flipping them a week later for, you know, 20, 30 percent appreciation. Um, it just feels to me like when it gets to be everybody's all in, that's when it's time to be concerned. So so. <laughs> I'm going to play slightly devil's advocate here. So I buy books from, from certain companies and I buy them for 25 bucks and they have a limited of 350. There's 500 people trying to get it. So when I get the book, I'm flipping it. But we're talking about a book that I bought for 25, trying to flip it for 50. What I think is part of the problem is that somebody's trying to buy a Hulk 181 for 10,000 and flip it for 25,000. I, would and agree. I, I, I would think agree. it. I think if you're trying to flip a book for double your profit and it's under a hundred dollars, while it definitely, if enough people are doing it and the volume's there, it, it definitely can affect that. And it definitely, you know, the weight can't support itself per se indefinitely, but also when you're dealing with larger numbers, it's much more complicated. And it's this idea that somebody's trying to buy a book for a hundred dollars and then sell for 700 is where I think it's going. And that massive inflation, it, it, it's too much, I think. And I think that, the value is going on. And I think what's the, the worst crime, in my opinion, is that a lot of this stuff that you're buying for a hundred, and if you're the one who's selling it, that's great because you took the money out and those people are winning. But all of a sudden, we're going to see it, I think, with stray dogs. I don't know if you've been following the stray dogs situation no, that's going on. No, I haven't. So stray dogs just got optioned as a TV show. And if you have the cover A of it, it was a $3 book like three years ago and it's selling for like $150. And there's this entire concern where people are like, oh man, this the sky is the limit here. And I think what's going to happen is that I think that it's fear of missing out is, is partaking. And I think that a bunch of people are going to lose their shirt where I think the book's going to fall back down to 50 sooner. A CGC variant of it, that was the variant that maybe was like a one in 25 and Nobody called me on that. Just sold for like six hundred fifty bucks, and it maybe was a thirty forty dollar book. It How was long CGC. Ago? How long ago did the book come out? Oh, like three years ago, maybe no, no, maybe two years ago, which is crazy to go from from a forty five dollar position to six hundred and twenty seven dollars is what the thing it sold on eBay for is a ludicrous appreciation, and because the book got optioned as a television show and as being in production. And I think it's fear of missing out. And I think the book is worth maybe $300 on a good day. And so I think that's also part of the problem is that there is also massive speculation on everything. Um, it sounds like it. The, like you, 
indicated earlier, inflation tends to create, um, uh, you know, all asset classes generally appreciate with inflation. Um, I have never seen collectibles appreciate like like I've witnessed in the last year to year and a half. Um, especially, you know, the key issues, especially uh, any book that's associated with a, a movie or a TV show that's going to be streamed. Um, I haven't been following what's been going on with Loki and um, uh, WandaVision and some of the other recent Marvel shows that have been out. Um, so I don't really know what's happening with those with those characters in the comics. Uh, I can only imagine that they're also appreciating significantly. But what sure. happens? Uh, yeah, please, please continue. So what what I would be concerned about is the market becomes oversaturated with too much material, uh, and I mean material, I mean too much um, awareness of these characters. And then everybody starts to kind of just get tired of it. It wears itself out. And then you've got people rushing to, to the exit at the same time. And then you've got all this downdraft in values that could happen. It could happen, you know, people could wake up one morning and everybody could just have the same feeling that they're just tired and bored with the characters. Um, you know, something else that's got me a little concerned is I don't know if you heard recently that um, CGC or C CCG, uh, Black just, Stone. yeah, they just sold a majority stake in their company to Blackstone. So, so I made a video on this and I broke it down, and I made the argument that they're not interested in the comic aspect of that business. They're interested in the other side of that business, and it's the card aspect of the business that, that they're interested in. CGC, prior to the sale, um, since, since I'm a customer, I actually caught wind of it and I signed up um, to, to, and I might've been flying down to Florida if I was chosen, I wasn't. And and I'm also broke, so this probably wouldn't have worked out, but they're hosting a two day free seminar, um, I think next week, in it on cards and grading. CGC has now entered the card game, much like PSA DNA, PSA DNA Beckett, okay. And, okay. and all those people. And so cards, and I know it's slightly off the top of the comp, but but trading, it's an indicator. Trading, you're referring to trading cards? Yeah, trading cards, Pokemon cards, Magic the Gathering, mm -hmm. um, basketball cards, football cards. Sure. Um, when one of these CGC has now entered the game. And CGC is touting, grading a lot of Pokemon cards. And some of those Pokemon cards sell for $30,000, dollars $50,000. I'm and, blown away. I'm blown away by that. And so, and so, I mean, I have a card that I got on my Cinnamon Toast Crunch. It's an Aloha Ponyta. It's a $25 card for a $3 box of cereal. It's a pretty good rate of return if I was to sell it. Uh -huh. I've sold Pokemon cards for $100. So, and, and they're, they're, they've done very well in appreciation. I was thrilled because it wasn't doing me any good. And I bought a comic with it, which was just awesome. But the, the whole point is that I think Blackstone bought CGC and a majority stake is... For, for not the comic aspect, but for the card aspect. And I, I can't confirm that, but that's just my view on it because cards are red hot right now and there's a whole bunch of things. And the reason why I say cards are red hot is you go to Target, you cannot buy basketball, baseball cards, or football cards, or I've Pokemon heard cards I've heard at that Target. from a number of comic book dealers or, or collectible dealers that, set, that have shops, you know, retail storefronts, that they can't keep the cards in and that people are actually fighting over Pokemon cards. There, there was a incident at Target and they have, if you go to a Target, I don't know when was the last time you went to a Target, they have a flyer saying, we don't sell cards here. And and, and they have saying, we don't sell Pokemon, basketball, football cards. And then the, the tiny little sets that they do have, which are the super like $50 boosters, they say one per household. And the reason why is that there was a fight apparently at Target and Target had to make an executive decision, probably by their CEO. I mean, this is this is like a top C level decision, saying we know that everybody wants this, but we can't risk people punching each other in our store. We can't risk our property getting damaged, and we right. can't risk our staff. More importantly, you can't risk your staff. It makes no sense. Yeah, it's not and, worth it for them, even though that there's it's a business, and uh, and it probably brings in. People to buy other things, like you said, they can't risk uh, the violence that could occur in the store. 
And they also can't risk somebody who's saying, I go to Target and I do my grocery shopping at Target. They can't risk me looking for, for, you know, my frozen foods and picking up, you know, my ice cream and then picking up some other items I need every, you know, Friday. They can't risk me getting hurt for when I have nothing to do with those cards that I'm picking up. That's they can't they, they can't risk somebody who has nothing to do with this getting hurt. Or, or I go and, I, and I'm a big Pop Funko fan, and then every once in a while, Target has like a cool exclusive Pop Funko. They can't risk me getting hurt. So that's my concern with Blackstone is not on the comic front. It's the idea that I think the resources are going to be driven to where the money is. And that's not saying they're going to get rid of the comic business, but I don't think CGC's future is comic oriented. I really don't. I could be wrong, and hopefully I am. But I'm curious how you think about that, because that's a very different aspect as well, because, you know, yeah, I, 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 um, I think that they're looking at the whole package of what they're getting. And I think, you know, it's it's obviously a big business. Um, I don't know the amount of the revenue that they generate there. I wouldn't be surprised. The, the business, just just to interrupt, um, the business is valued over five hundred million dollars right now. I heard what, I heard Blackstone uh, evaluated the company because they put in over two hundred fifty million, and if they have a majority stake, it's clearly that that it's worth that uh, valuation sheet wise. Yeah, so it's it's interesting when you think of it, this this industry is is actually bringing it. You know, it's it's um, creating a lot of interest from private equity. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the least. If we hear a year from now, maybe two years from now, that they want to take the company public, that it will become a publicly traded company. The same thing I think is going to happen with Heritage. Heritage is a mammoth of an auctioneer. I wouldn't be surprised if either the principals at Heritage take that company public and it becomes traded. Uh, you know, Sotheby's and um, some of the other big auction houses are now are now publicly traded stocks. Wouldn't surprise me if if Heritage became traded or it became it be got became bought out by another institutional investor. Yeah, I I think I think that there's real money now in, in all of this, and I think there's real money in a variety of things that that are going on. And, and big money's good in, in a lot of ways, but it's also very bad because at this they, there's a whole bunch of problems with CGC right now. I mean. I just submitted a book to, to CBCS, which is CGC's competitor. And, you know, that I'm not going to get that book back till September or October. I mean, this is this is how crazy it is, is that everything wow. is so backed up. And CGC was like, I think they were like, stop taking submissions for a while from regular submissions. And they're doing all these in-house things and all that stuff is ridiculous. And I'm in an entire video on that, how it actually costs you more money when they're doing it in-house and it's cheaper for CGC to do it and everybody's making more money except you the fan so 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 I, I, I'm, are you talking about the pressing are you talking about the pressing of the book or i'm i'm talking about the the private signings that cgc is oh doing. right 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 okay because they charge an additional 10 to 50 dollars per signature on that then they would add at a con mm. um i i'm I'm really curious what where this goes. Uh, you know, I, I hope that I'm wrong because I would feel bad for all the collectors that have kind of, kind of, you know, gotten into the market in the last year to two years because they think it's it's a a money making business just to flip comic books. Um, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it doesn't come cascading down. So, so the the way I view it is the following. So I am a big proponent of Apple stock, like, like iPhone, Apple. And, and I'm expecting, because we, we started speaking about inflation. This is just my opinion. So, so, so don't take anybody this as advice. I'm expecting that, that, that we're going to have a deflation position anywhere from 18 to 24 months out. And I don't, I'm not happy about it because I'm going to lose a significant amount of money, but I'm not going to sell any of my stock. And so I think Apple is going to take a bit of a haircut. But I also think Apple's going to rise back up. And so I think one of the things that has to be analyzed with all of this is that, 
they, they look at the 90 bust that happened and then the entire thing where everything got and the bubble popped. It's the idea though that if you had the right books during the 90 pop and you just held on to it, you would be doing fine. If you, you know, I think the bubble pop, what, 97, 98, I want to no, say? Not, yeah, yeah. So if you had Hulk 181 in 95 and you just held on to it till 2018, you did perfectly fine on that deal because you had a good quality product. The question for me and what I think is concerning is that the bubble is going to pop. No question about it, in my view. Now, it's, it's and I could be poo-pooed, I could be shot at, but I also think that it's the idea that if you buy the right items now and you buy quality stuff, whether you're buying modern good stuff or you're buying the old stuff or the Silver Age or some of the good Bronze Age stuff mm -hmm. or just like key issues like the DC Presents number 26. I have a nice copy of that book. That book has will always appreciate because it's a major issue when you have the first appearance of Starfire, Cyborg, and Beast. No, not Beast Boy, Raven. Like, you can't get around that as a key. That, that is the key. And a 7.5 will always appreciate. A 9.8 will always appreciate. It's just the way it is. But a book like Stray Dogs, I don't know if we're going to be talking about it in 20 years. And I think people are going to sort of get beat up a little bit on it. How do you feel about Turtles? The animal or, or, or the comic? It's a, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a, you, you gave me that one. You gave me that one. Okay. But, but you gave it to me. The Teenage oh, Mutant Ninja Turtles, how do you feel about I'm this? I'm so sorry. I had to make that joke. I've been, I've been, I've been waiting to use that you joke. Me. You got me. <laughs> okay. So there was, there was a discussion in another group about this. And I forget the two. It was Spawn vs. Turtles. And I said Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles every day of the week. I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is brilliant. I think that book is great. I think that that first book, low low print run, really cool, cool cover when you actually start to look at it. What's going on with that? I think even the second and third print run of those books are great on the first issue. And I also think a lot of the value is built in the IP. It's not built in to, to the actual first issue. It's built into the IP has launched a massive fifty million plus dollar IP, and that's how I view Turtles. Is that I'm not buying if I was to buy a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles first issue in a nine point eight signed or unsigned, I'm not buying the the comic. I'm buying the IP. But just because you're, you, this is what I made, and I actually made an entire video on this. Is that to replicate what Kevin Eastman and Kevin Lard did, or Peter Lard, Peter Lard did, um, it is beyond difficult to do that in today's age because there's just so much content out there. But I think that if you had to pick between Spawn One and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles One, you pick Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all day, every day, and you're stupid if you don't. Um. So you think it's the IP that's really created a lot of um, uh, excitement about the book and and the and the product? Yes, I, I think I think it is. I think it's the IP. I think it's the fact that Nickelodeon and Vitacom pretty much owns it, and that IDW is really smart, and they brought Kevin Eastman back for a bunch of issues, and I still think he's writing it, and he does like a cover every once in a while, and I think he, you know, you know. They're, they're really smart at IDW, and it's a great company to license out. And I also think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, as a product in IDW is surrounded by Sonic the Hedgehog. It's surrounded by Ghostbusters. It's surrounded by a bunch of other really licensed out products like Star Trek. Right. And it works. It huh. works, and it, it, it pumps it up tremendously. And I'm not saying that because I interviewed Chris Ryle, who headed up IDW, and I got to interview Kevin Eastman. Uh, also, I'm not just saying that, and I like both of them, and they've been very nice to me, both of them. And that's not the point here. It's not the point. And, and David Buher also does Canto. Not just saying that because because I want to write for IDW, but that's not the point here. Um, I think it is the IP in all seriousness because I think it's the fact that when you have a TV show on Nickelodeon, you know, it, it changes the game tremendously, and every kid – you know, is home and doesn't want to do his homework and he's watching the turtles. I mean, come on. And then you go backwards to, to the eighties and it's like all these 80 babies know it too. And then what do you think I want to show my kids when I have them? 
I show them Avatar: The Last Airbender and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So they have a lot. The, the the shelf life is is long. Is what you're saying? It's been around. Oh. How I don't know when they came out. I remember that I wasn't that impressed with the first movies that came out. Oh, I mean, I wasn't impressed, but I enjoyed them. I mean, I, but then again, but then again, I'm like six. So everything's impressive to me when I'm six. When when I'm 28, that movie's not impressive. Right. <laughs> right. The, the, they're, coming the, the, a, they're coming out with a new movie, aren't they? They're coming out with something. I haven't been paying much attention to it. I just know that my, the, the way I view it is that I think it's an IP play. And and I don't mean to embarrass some of my friends. He, he said, hey, you know, support indie. And I'm a big proponent of supporting indie comics and all that stuff. And people are saying, oh, we could be the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. No indie comics. They, they, you can't replicate what Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did. It is beyond hard. You know, the closest thing that has ever come to it is The Walking Dead. And it is still about 30 million shy of what that has done. I was going to say that about The Walking Dead. That, and I that, like The Walking Dead. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed yeah. The Walking Dead. Um, so, you know, if you were going to ask me what books do I think have the most potential to, uh, to increase or appreciate in value in the next, let's say, three to five years, I would probably say um, I would still go with the Marvel uh, Bronze Age stuff has the most potential to get to really accelerate in value. Um, and the main characters that I'm referring to are going to be Captain America, Samariner, Silver Surfer, um, and obviously Spider-Man. I, 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 I don't disagree with that. I mean, I also think, think, think one of the things that is, is also just naturally going to appreciate is Miles Morales. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimate fallout four because, um, because of venom yeah it, it, it's 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 the black suit it's the black spider-man it's the spider-man and, and people can call me out for whatever they want to call me out on that one for um but it's this idea that there's a whole generation of kids who are playing on their ps4s and fives and they're playing as that character and that's peter parker is not their spider-man yeah. Miles and is. I was there thinking of when you said the Black Spider Man. I was thinking of Venom, but you're you're talking about the the cartoon character or, or the, the into the Spider Verse, into the Spider Verse's right. character, and he appears in Ultimate Fallout Four. And that book, also the things that there's a lot of those books that were printed, but a lot of people laughed at it. And then when they realized five years later, you couldn't find that book on the shelf anymore. And that's what's crazy about that book is that. You couldn't find that book on the shelf anymore. And that's what makes that book cool. And I have two of them. And and I was actually supposed to get uh, Bendis and Bagley to sign it when I used to live in D.C., but COVID hit. And I was going to get both of them sign, signing signing it. Well, I can't speak. And actually have it graded, which, and at the time, that book was like 1200 bucks, And it probably would have caught like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 per book. Um, but, but I was going to keep one for myself because I'm also a collector. But essentially, I would have sold one that would have paid for the other and then some, which is how it should be done. So, Andrew, let me ask you this. Um, how do you what is the 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 method that you sell your books? How do you, maybe you can help me understand what what is the, the more contemporary method of selling comic books today? Unless uh, if you're not a dealer. Um, it, it's, it's weird. So, so, so I'm going to break this into two positions because, because I'm in a transition point. I'm actually slowly moving into, into the exclusive realm and developing my own exclusives, hopefully in the next 12 months or so. Um, so, so, so that, that, that's, that's more of websiting and okay. I don't know, I don't know what, what constitutes a dealer for per se. So I don't want to be a comic shop. I don't want to carry an 807 and carry 15 copies of 807, carry Batman 603. I'm, I'm putting out random numbers. Superman 7. is. It, I don't want to be with Diamond or Lunar or Penguin Random House books. I don't want to go that route. I want to deal in exclusives. But that's different than the being a dealer. It's, it's sort of a dealer, though. Um, but the way I like to sell my books in particular is that I like to use eBay. Um, and the reason why I like to use eBay is eBay provides me protection. They take 13%, but I have a lot of protection on eBay. I'm also don't have to deal with people. 
I also understand how to operate eBay and I've been selling things on eBay for the last 10 years. And so as an individual, I feel very comfortable on eBay. I've tried selling on Facebook Marketplace. I don't like it as much. I don't like the the lack of protection and it's the Wild West. I don't like, you know, Facebook Live sales. I haven't done them, but I'm I'm not. I'm in my parents' house and I think they would shoot me to do it. And and also you need help when you're doing it, especially if you have like a hundred people in there. You need people to write down names. And it could be very difficult and you also got to be entertaining and you have to have racks and, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very physical activity and it is not something that I physically want to do um, on my body. And I think it'd be very difficult and I don't just have the time to sell live. Um, so I prefer to sell on eBay. I'm obviously going to wind up probably opening up a Shopify store when I get into the exclusive game, just because I'm going to have 200 copies of a book of the same book it would be difficult to sell that on eBay. Right. Um, and I'm probably also gonna wholesale some of that out as well. But again, that that's a different position because when you're dealing with an exclusive, and so what, what, what an exclusive means for, for everybody who's interested, it means that I pay an artist and, and I pay, or I have an arrangement with somebody to get a comic they've done, I pay the artist, and then that book is only distributed through me. Um, I think that's a great, I, I think that's a brilliant idea. And, 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 and I, I sell exclusives from Zenoscope when they have a 350 print run. So there's only 350 of those books out there. And so that's sort of the direction I'm going in is that, and I'm still going to sell regular stuff as well. It's just that I'm starting to understand that, hey, you know, because I want, this is a business. And my entire position, and I'm very open about this, is that my entire purpose with, with the comic stuff is to sell comics, pay Buy something for twenty dollars, sell for fifty. eBay takes their position. I cash out sixteen dollars. I put that into the stock market, and then I take that money that it cost me. I pay the fee, and then I pay myself back, and then I buy another book and keep repeating it. And so I'm weird because because I'm technically a comic book investor, but I also understand how to buy and sell something and take out your profits, Mm -hmm. which some people don't tell you to do. Sure, because it's just the cost of just there is a cost of doing business regardless, right? And, and so, and so, my my theory is that this is going to fall the fuck apart at some point. Now it'll recover and it'll fall apart again, and it will recover. I went through February twenty twenty, and when your portfolio was down twenty five to thirty five percent in the stock market, what did I do? I bought more in. My point, and I've done very well since That's, then. That was smart. You you know, a lot of people were running the other way. I did the same thing. I bought in uh, in March after the market had already collapsed 40%, 35%, whatever it was in March. And, um, and you're right. And now today, I'm looking like a genius. And, and, so, and so I have stocks that I have 110% rate of return. In a very short amount of time, I also have stocks that I bought legitly two months ago that I have a 400% rate of return on. Um, but that that's not the point. The, the, my, my entire thing is that I understand as, as, as an investor and as a business that I'd rather keep what, what I'm doing and not grow it, but take those profits out. And then because when all of this falls apart, I have no debt on my company and on what I'm doing, which is great, which means that I could sit and do nothing. When everything hits and I don't have to sell anything. Now, I would like to sell things because I want to keep on investing into, into the stock market, into things that produce me dividends. And, 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 but, but the idea here is that for me, I have no debt. And when you have no debt, I could wait years on books. And I have. And I mean, I sold a Mike DeBaffo book. And he's an artist who works for Zenoscope and Dynamite and a few other companies. Bought the book for $20. And then five years later... When I needed money to buy the next month comics, and I'm like, hey, you know, I need like 50 bucks to get my comics for the next month. It's a $120 book. I sold for $110 just to make the deal happen faster. And taking 10 bucks off is a no brainer. And then all of a sudden, that is, I think it's worth $120. That's a 43% annualization rate per year. Wow. I mean, I mean, but I had to wait five years, but I didn't need the money. And then I'm now also getting into the game where, like I just sold a Carnage book 
and, and an ideal that way. So, so, so I look at what movies are coming out, and when that Carnage trailer dropped, I sold my Carnage Pop Funko for $65, because I sell Pops as well, and then I sold the Carnage book, which was the Carnage um, Mark Bagley Skyline. And I sold that book for, for a good amount of money, and then I bought the book back just recently for significantly less than I'm gonna resell it again. So there's a lot of ways, but but to answer the question. Let me just, okay, so my uh, my laptop, I'm getting it, uh, it's not plugged in right now, but it looks like my cord's in another room in my house. I'm mm -hmm. at like 8% power left on my laptop. Run! <laughs> If you if you give me a minute, I can grab my cord. I oh, yeah, take the, your time. Can you? We could do it. We could do a commercial break. All right, give me a minute. Hold on. I'm back. My dog came down to join me. That's fine. That's fine. It's very informal. It's, it's it's an open discussion. It's not meant to be contentious. Okay. As long as my parents aren't killing me, I'm I'm good. <laughs> so let me let me ask you your opinion on a book that I bought not too long ago. Um, the Shang Chi uh, um, Special Marvel Edition number fifteen. Do you have any opinion of that? So. I think with 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 Shang Chi, and, and I don't know as much about Shang Chi as as I should, but I don't know exactly when the movie's coming out. But I know the trailer dropped because because I think that the next big Marvel thing, which is sort of Sony, is Venom two. Right. So so and I'm gonna I'm answering the question indirectly because I think it'll answer it directly for for those who are wondering where I'm going with this. So I don't know when it's coming out, but I think the trailer dropped which meant this spike happened already, and then it goes into a valley, and then when the movie hits, and that's when I would sell it again. And I would I would list it, and I would get it, because it's gonna get a natural spike, or an artificial, or natural, or it's just the cycle of it. And then it's gonna sort of level out a little bit higher, because there's a movie now. And then when they make a sequel, and we know they're gonna make a sequel if it does well, or Shang Chi. I think Shang Chi is a character in this. I'm not as good as Marvel stuff. I'm more of a DC guy. Uh -huh. um, but 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 it's this idea that if they make a sequel or like you know Doctor Strange, for instance, obviously WandaVision led into Doctor Strange, the TV show. So obviously that is where all the, whenever Shang Chi, if there's Shang Chi two, it's going to spike even more. So if you're looking to make an exit, the time to make an exit is when the movie's coming out. Or about to come out or during the trailer because my venom book and the reason why i bring this up is the venom trailer drops and that pop funko and then the reason why i use the pop funko is it's an easy number it's 15. um normally that didn't that thing spiked like crazy where that pop funko came out in 2018 new york comic-con and that thing dropped by half two weeks after it came out and now it slowly was stabilizing at about 25 dollars and then it went all the way up to 65 real quick when the trailer came out. And so that's a big spike. And then now it's more around 40. And then it's going to probably spike back up to about 70 in September. It comes out, which will probably be later this year. It's it's a September, I want to say. And yeah, so the same time the, that's the same time the Marvel uh, Shang-Chi movie is supposed to come out. The more, I think it's called Shang-Chi, the Master of Ten Rings or something. And, and so that that's how I view it is that I think that's what 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 is the time to sell it because a lot of eyes are on it and a lot of people want it and a bunch of people are going to vibe for the the, the 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 book and there's going to be more people who want it than not and competition in that sense doesn't matter 
you know, I'm gearing up. Obviously, you know, Spider-Man 60 is happening. I have some Venom books that I'm going to unload. I mean, and I'm picking up some Venom books purposely because I know in September I just actually got them. And, and they didn't come in the best condition, which I'm trying to work out with, with the employer. But it's this idea that I know in September there's going to be an added premium to it. What grade, when you're buying books, do you target a certain grade um, or are you buying raw books? So I, it's weird in which that I am, it depends. So if there's a cheap graded book, it's great. I'm trying to get a 9.8 depending on it. Or if it's an older book and depending on my, my economics, I'll hit a lower grade because because depending on what it is, like my, my 7.5 uh, DC presents number 26. You know, I don't need a 9.8 on that unless I want to spend $400 or I want to spend 150 bucks. I didn't have $150. But at the same time, there's sometimes like a book that came, just came out. I want a 9.8 of it. If it came out and it's on the shelves, I want to get a 9.8 of it. But I bought books that are 9.4s just because a 9.8 is just not on the internet. And and some like I bought a, a Big Dog Inc., a uh, Nia Rafino and J. Scott Campbell book that finding a 9.8 in that, good luck. Because the people who have 9.8 of that don't sell them. And so, and then sometimes also, like, books just don't show up what in 9.8. What, what was the book that you just mentioned? It's 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 a Big Dog Inc. book. Um, I think it's J. Scott Campbell and Nia Rafino, or it might be a Nia Rafino soul cover. And, um, it's like Wicked West volume number nine, volume two. It's something like that. I, I forget the exact title, but, but it's, it's a very, very, very early Campbell. I think early Nia Rufino, And that book just does not come up as a 9.8. So if you see a 9.4 and it's a good price, I mean, the book cost me 18 bucks and a 9.4. I'm not going to say no to a $18, 9.4 book. And that book, if I want to sell that book, it's probably a hundred, hundred twenty dollar book and a nine point four. So to talk, talk about positioning, but I it all to, depends. I need to get more advice from you. It sounds like you're the guy that knows what to buy. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a crazier story. So Zenoscope, and, and and I'm gonna embarrass, and it might cause part part in my relationship. They sent me a damaged book, significantly damaged. Now the book was twenty five dollars. I sold the book for forty two dollars. I only made five bucks on the book. If the book was in pristine condition, I would have sold it for 55. But the fact that I sold a damaged book with some serious corner wear on it for $42, I made $5 in profit on it, you know, and it's a raw book. So this is like when, when I'm buying a raw book, I want it as pristine as possible. So I understand the more pristine it is, the better likelihood it's going to be sold. But I also understand that damaged books, and this took me a while to understand that People will pay good money for damaged books because not everybody wants to go out and spend $300 on a book. Some people say, hey, look, I want this in my collection, but if you're going to sell it to me for $75 and it comes out as an 8.5, I'm going to press it. Maybe I can get up to a 9.0 for $75, no brainer. And so not everybody wants or can afford. And that, that's, that's the craziest thing. Me and I actually have to run the numbers in it, and I'm curious. I haven't done it yet, and I should. And I'm not exactly sure how to set it up, so I'm probably gonna have to consult somebody. But I'm wondering what actually has a better rate of return: a Hulk 9.8 or a Hulk 6.0? And the reason why, and I know what people might be thinking when I say this, but it's the idea that if a 6.0 only costs you $200 to get into it, or maybe it costs you $1,200, but then you could sell it for 7500 and a 9.8 costs you 15000 and you can sell for 33 I mean, which one has the better rate of return given? Won't you go on to what's it called, GPA analysis, uh, the website, won't it? And you can follow a graph and it, you can actually see rates of return for different graded books. I mean, I haven't done it and I'm just giving out random yeah. numbers. I'm sure, I'm sure better, that. I have a better. Uh, question that I've been trying to figure out. If you would have bought Disney and you're a stock guy too, so you understand this, what where would you have gotten a better return? Buying, let's say, a um uh, yeah, Hulk one eighty one is, is a great example of this. So Hulk saw, 181, uh, what ten years ago versus buying Disney stock 
10 years ago. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll use a better example. Apple versus Hulk 181. I like you're, that one. because that's you're not comparing apples to apples. Fair, 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 fair enough. Disney versus, versus Hulk 181. Right. Because I already so, know the rate of return for Disney over the last 10 years. Right. So well, 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 what's the rate of return for, for it Disney? Like three, if you had bought Disney stock yeah. uh, 10 years ago and – and and what it's compared to what it's worth today, it's appreciated three hundred and fifty percent. So 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 I know what Hulk has done. I wish we could have started at ninety three because ninety three up to two thousand nineteen. I know the rate of return per year of Hulk one eighty one, which okay. has an annualization rate of three point seven percent. Which which um and that's according to Otis. Otis um for, for those who don't know with Hulk one eighty one. They um are you familiar with Otis by any chance? No. Otis basically buys non-shareable items and breaks them into shares. So you could buy sneakers. So think about it like you could buy, you know, uh Michael Jordan's, you know, game worn last game used sneakers that he won with the Bulls, right? And it's a two hundred thousand dollar item. Otis will buy the item and then they might sell five hundred dollar shares. All the way up to two hundred thousand of what the item is worth. Yeah, so they sell fractional shares of something. So, so, so you you're buying like like a piece of it. So you could buy fifteen hundred dollars, but you don't want to hold the shoes. You don't want to touch the shoes. And then the idea is that in four or five years or ten years, Otis will sell it, and whatever they make on it, you get a piece of it. Right. And so they did that with Hulk one eighty one. And when you do that, you actually have to disclose from a legal position a whole you know prospectus chart. And so I broke down the Hulk 181 chart from 93 and a 9.8 because if you bought Hulk 181 in 93, in 93, um, graded, it's a $300 book. Otis bought theirs, I think, for like $37,000. Now, you have to understand, though, that in 2013, Hulk 181 was a $9,000 book. And the previous year, it was like a $12,000 book. So if you bought in at the right time, so if you bought in when Hulk 181 was eight grand and a 9.8, and then you wrote it all the way up to 33,000, you know, that, that, that's a great rate of return. If you bought at $300 and go all the way up to 33,000, that's good too. So I, I like to compare it to the S&P 500 because the S&P 500 has an annualization rate um, on average of about 9.8% over the last 70 years. Now, that doesn't mean the S&P does that every single year. Sometimes it loses money, much like Hulk 181 loses. So because Hulk 181 has had years where it's added five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 to the value. And the S&P has not done that per share by far. But then you look at 2019, the S&P was up 38% in a year. So it, it, it's tricky, but, but obviously, I mean, it, it, all, it also all depends that with Disney and the other thing, and this is... Because I'm an alternative investor, a comic book doesn't return me money until somebody wants to buy it. That's that's a good point. That's and a very Disney good point. Disney produces dividends, even though even though I think they just reinstated their dividend, but for the most part they produce dividends. Right. And so that's the other thing too is that okay, what has Disney produced as far as a dividend? And what could I have used that money for? Or what if I kept on buying new shares and new shares and new shares and new shares? And so, because I'm a drip guy. And so that that's the other thing too. It, it's so complicated. Um, but it is a great, great question on that is that what is more productive? What 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 is a better bang for your buck? So so what I would do, maybe the a different way of looking at that, instead of looking at one comic book, Let's say we examined buying a, uh, a, col a small group of comic books. So, it's, so let's say you bought $10,000 worth of Disney stock 10 years ago. And, and, and then you, you put it against a comic book portfolio of, of, of the top keys, for instance. Correct. A small, uh, maybe around, but we've got to compare it the same dollar amount. So yeah, maybe yeah. you bought $10,000 worth of a couple key issues of comic books. That's how I would look at it, but it's a good, it's certainly a good study into, you know, what's, what's a better investment, buying a stock or buying a comic book. And also, also it gets very, very interesting as well when, when you start dealing with taxes and things like that, because equity plays 
Because remember, when you get a dividend for those who don't know, on that is taxable income. And so if you have 10,000, and we could put Disney at $100, let's say you bought 10,000 shares of Disney, you, you, no, no, you bought 1,000 shares. Wow, I can't do math. Wow. It would be 100 shares. Thank it was $100, you. You bought, would have bought 100 shares, right? I, I was in Rebo math. Please bear with me, everybody. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, look, the bottom line is it would be really interesting if we could figure that out. And I've proposed this to several people, and they really kind of just scratched their head, and they really didn't bother doing the exercise. Uh, people that are smarter than me, and they just – I don't think they were interested. Um, but it would be a good exercise to do. So I, I don't disagree, and I think – because because the, the way I invest, if, for, for those who are curious – um, this is just me, is that I have my comic books, and that's complete equity. I have Pop Funkos, I have some baseball cards and Pokemon cards, and then I have a little crypto. And that, for the most part, is complete equity, and I make my exits through, through I make my gains through appreciation, I make my exits that way, and that's fine. But then I also have stocks that produce a lot of dividends in a lot of different ways, and things like you know mutual funds and ETFs. And, you know, other things such as CDs and, and other bank positions that produce me a rate of return. So I am very diversified in both. And so as an investor, the reason why I like my comic book stuff and why I'm into it is that it is straight equity and straight equity is a lot of fun. But I also turn my straight equity into royalties, essentially through dividends. But I also pay for it so that I'm never I carry debt, but it's prepaid debt, if that makes any sense, where I'm not ever have a loan against my business. It's just, a, I have to pay it back to myself. Okay. And, and, and because, because the thing is that it, if you have debt, if you took out $10,000 in debt and you still have comps, you're going to be forced to sell to pay back your loan unless you want the interest under your loan running. And that's what I'm avoiding completely because it gives you a lot of power where I can wait six years on a book and get whatever price I want to get on it. I have a $175 book that nobody's interested in buying right now, but somebody in two years might be interested. And if I needed to pay that money back quickly, and I owed money to people, I might have to take 50 bucks off that book. But to, to get back to, to the point of actually the study, it is super interesting because obviously comparing portfolio against portfolio, it can be very interesting. And especially versing a long-term and a short-term position. Because right now we live in a very high end position where everything is going crazy. When you have a book that you got to put forty dollars into it and then you got six hundred out of it, you know I don't know if Disney can do that every year. Um, that is probably true. That is but probably then true. again, at a certain point, those books can also go down. Just the same way where there could be six months of that a book's red hot. And then all of a sudden that, that evaluation gets down to 500, 400, 300. And then all of a sudden that evaluation stays at $150. And yeah. now it's only a $150 tradable asset. You and know, it fell 75%. See, I, so. I, you know, now I collect pre-code horror. Uh, horror comic books from the 1950s. That's what I like. Uh, a lot of EC, I, I bought and sold EC comics. Are you familiar with EC? Oh, yeah. yeah I know EC. Tales from the Crypt, Fall of Horror, Haunt of Fear. That's that's always been my passion, um, at least more recently. But what a lot of people don't understand is that, you know, when collections come to the market, let's say right now there's only so many Hulk 181s available, and then all of a sudden somebody decides to fl to sell. They've got 20 issues or 30 issues all at once, and they've all been they're all high grade issues. Well, that's going to impact the market dramatically. Same thing happened when William H. Gaines, the editor for EC Comics, Mad Comics, Mad Magazine, when he passed away, his estate sold his collection. He had a bunch of um, file copies. He had one issue of every EC comic. He had 12 runs, but he had one issue of each comic in each run. When they came to market, they were all high grade. Most of them were high grade books. I would say anything above an 8.0 or 8.5. That really impacted the desirability or the value of all the people that had been collecting ECs prior to that. 
And, and this is why I, I deal with books that only have 250 print runs, 350 print runs. These, even if all 350 come to market and they don't all come to market at the same time, there is a limitation on it. And when, when you get down to books that have a 75 print run, you know, there's only so many that come to market. You know, the book that, 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 that there's a book that I think there maybe is one more on eBay right now of it that I have listed up there. And so obviously if you want it, you have to come to me. And, and, and that that's how I view it. That's why I'm a big Xenoscope fan is because when you have things that are limited, you know, it, it's definitely protects that. And right. even if stuff comes to market and look, you know, there's a bunch of books on Xenoscope that are all coming to market at the same time. And I'm competing with a lot of people forcing me to go down and my price and my profit gets cut. But at the same time, it, it's still pretty limited. If you have a 500 print run, there's only 500 of these books and statistically not all of them are 9.8s. So, so, so that, that's how I invest, but, but I completely get it where if you have, you know, certain Batman, you know, Batman 100 or Detective 1000, there are so many copies of that and it's crazy. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody has like nine Hulk 181s and they all list them at the same time. I mean, that, that cuts the, the complete profit out of it. And it's not good. It's, 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 it's not good. And people don't understand that. You know, and, and if these people were smart, they would all coordinate with each other. They would all coordinate with each other. And and they say, hey, look, I'm listing mine in the month of October. You list yours in November. You list yours in December. And everybody has a code. And if you break the code, then everybody just floods the market to punish that person. And then and, and, and it'll work. That's how people really should need to think now. Well, you got to be careful because then you could get into a class action situation. That that is true. That that is true. If everybody's colluding together to do that, fair, fair enough. <laughs> we won't talk about that on 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 your show. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but 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 even still, people should be very aware of of stuff like that. That that, that it's kind of like you know, you know. I like to list books when nobody's listing books. I, th and, I think and, that's the way to go. I think if you can do that, so that's when you say well, that's when you say you're an exclusive dealer for the book. Is that what you mean? Oh, no, no, no. I like to, so, so, so I sometimes get a book ahead of time or it arrives early and I order a book from Zenoscope and I know I'm going to put it up on eBay. Second it comes in, I list it because there's less people there. And I know in a day or two, there's going to be 10 other or 15 or 20 other people who are listing it. And the only way I can compete is if I'm there first. So, 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 so when, when I have books, that that's how I deal with those problems. Are you now? Do you read a lot of the books that you buy? I read them digitally. Okay. So I have a Comicsology subscription, and also, also, so Zenoscope, what they do is that they'll sell the same book with different cover art for twenty or twenty-five dollars, and then you can buy the exact same book for four dollars. Yeah, I'm going to read the four-dollar book, right. not the twenty-five-dollar book. If that makes a of, sense. A lot of the guys that I communicate with online about their that are EC collectors, well, they keep their raw issues so that they can read them, and they like the whole feeling. Still, you know, I've I've talked to them about this. They like the idea of holding a book in their hand and turning the pages. The the the, the natural feeling of it. So I do a lot of this too. I read a lot of graphic novels. Uh huh. And so I like reading a graphic novel because. I missed this series it's called Courier by, by Zenoscope. Um, and I just said, okay, it's, you know, it's a $20 book. And instead, I'll just pick up a graphic novel. And then also I have a Comixology subscription. And Comixology has all this graphic novel stuff. And they have like 80% of Zenoscope's library on there. I am reading stuff that I also don't want to buy. Right. And I also don't have room for it. It's, it's not even a matter anymore of, of cost. It's a matter of man, if I buy 50 graphic novels a year, I gotta put that somewhere, you know? And and it gets you old download, so soon. You download the book and you store it on your hard drive? I, I, I store it on my iPad and then it's there and then once, you know, you borrow the book. So, so, so I can download it, I can read it offline. So if I'm on a plane, I, I'll download 20 books on Comixology and then I'm good for the plane ride. And then, and once I'm done, 
I then just say, hey, I'm returning the book to Comixology. And it's great. And they have everything from, from every publisher. They have stuff from, from IDW. They have stuff from Titan. They have stuff from Zenoscope. They have stuff from Marvel DC. And then they have stuff that, that's even more obscure. And so for me, when I want to read comics, it's just easier to read something digitally. When I want to sell comics, I'm not going to go and read a $100 book because right. there's too much that can go wrong. I, I hear you. I and, hear so, and so that, that's where I'm at. I, and also, it's accessibility. I mean, there's stuff that, that, that I don't want to buy from companies. And I'm like, man, that story was good, but it wasn't my hard-earned dollars good. If that makes where, any sense. Um, where are you – now, do you mind me asking, where are you based out of? I'm in Connecticut, um, and all my friends are in Connecticut, and my parents are in Connecticut. But I used to live in D.C., and I love D.C., um, and I don't know anything about Connecticut's like comic market or anything like that, but eBay allows me to sell it to the world, and, and it's, it's it's the greatest thing ever. Are you going to go? Okay, so when the shows start, the comic book conventions start happening again, which I think we're supposed to have. I'm in Baltimore. We're supposed to have the Balticon coming up in October here. You probably have. There's stuff in New York too, right? So New York Comic Con is sold out, and I don't like New York Comic Con. It's too aggressive for me. Uh-huh. Um, I walk on crutches, <laughs> and it's too aggressive okay. um, for, 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 for me. And also, I'm also sitting this year out um, for, for a few of, reasons. Because of the pandemic. Oh, uh, the pandemic. And also, right now, I am shifting focus on business, and New York Comic Con will just drain me dry. And then it'll take another year to do what I want to do. As far as picking up exclusives and, you know, t I've taken in more inventory and I'm selling more on eBay than I've ever sold. I've probably tripled what, what I used to sell on eBay. Um, and I've been very aggressive in the first six months of this year. And I'm not doing very well. And I've actually added a lot of wealth. So right now, I don't have the capital to go to New York. And I don't think it would be a wise move economically for me this year. Um, it, it, it's just that at some point I will go back and I'm looking forward to going back to conventions, but I'm also going to be a lot smarter with them because they, I, I just, I just think that, you know, is I think that they don't bring too much money to me. They, they, I used to do panels at cons and I never got anybody. I got people in my room. People love to hear what I was speaking about. Never got paid to do any of that. Got a free ticket, which is help when, when tickets are a hundred dollars, it, it is super mm -hmm. helpful. But at the same time, I never got in a fan out of it. And then I did 90 interviews with indie comic people and a variety of other people in 2020. I did 92 so far this year. And if I run a $20 Facebook ad, I can get 40 people. And out of those 40 people, 10 of them are fans. And the other 30 are interested every once in a while. But I've gotten more people off of 20 bucks every other week than I've ever gotten at a con. And so... And then, then even if I wanted to do Facebook live sales, I mean, I could fill up an entire, you know, event and go for six hours and probably sell through a bunch of my collection if I really wanted to. And I had some help. But again, I'm not at that stage yet. So for, for me, I just think great pivotalization is that I get every comic I want digitally. I can get every comic delivered to me e-commerce and I can get anything I want graded sent in. And I can get it signed now, graded, sent in if I really wanted to. So okay. it's, it's just like, I just think that, you know, I'm not against cons. I just think that there's just so much more money to be made elsewhere. Yeah, and it's the dealers charge, I think they charge a lot of money for books at the cons, don't they? I there's think no, so. No bar, very few bargains at, at, the, at the comic cons. So, 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 so I, I, I'll ask you a question. X Men, giant size X Men one. What do you think it sold for in twenty twenty? Before COVID, a one point out. Probably twenty seven thousand, twenty five, twenty seven thousand. Uh, a one point out, a one point out of that book. Great. Oh, a one point out. Yeah, in in twenty twenty, twenty nineteen, twenty twenty. Eight hundred bucks, nine hundred bucks. So round there, like a thousand to twelve hundred on average. What do you think it sell, sold for two months ago in 2021? 2,500 bucks? 
about 2,100. Now, my friend was at a con. What he was explaining to me is that people weren't even looking at that book. And so, and so people were looking for certain books. They had their list and they had lists. They didn't have their app. They didn't have their phone app. They had a list of what they needed and that nobody was looking to pick up anything obscure or out of their list unless it was like a three or $4 book. And he even said like when he was walking around, he saw people that were like, okay, I got this, 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 this. And they were looking what they needed to complete their collection, which I think is what's going to happen. And, and I'm curious what you think, because I could tell you that if I go to a con, even if it's a small con, I don't necessarily have a list. I'm looking for something cool, but I used to go to shows in the middle of COVID and we used to wear masks. And I said, okay, I got 50 bucks. I got $50 for fun. Once that $50 is out, I'm done. Had a great time and it was it's nice, but I wasn't looking at anything to complete my collection. I was just looking for cool books. And, 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 I, and I bought like 12 cool books for 50 bucks. But that's the thing that I think is going to happen now is that I don't think people are going to be spending excess money at conventions, which then creates a whole bigger problem economically. Because if a dealer becomes unprofitable, they're not, and they take a loss, they're not going to be happy with the con. The con's not going to be happy. They're going to reevaluate. And again, I can go and legitimately spend $20 on Facebook and get more action to anything I want. Then spending five hundred dollars at a table and have to sell, not yeah. knowing. So what's so the curious. question? What's your what's your question? So, so I'm curious what you think about that because it's an ecosystem question. As as somebody who who obviously is is buying and selling comics and has been collecting, what do you think that's going? Because the ecosystem matters as well. Because if the dealer at a convention doesn't do well. You know they're not going to show up the next year or they might not even be able to show up the next year or their business might even fail or they might be put into a rough situation I think, yeah i i think that in the beginning i think a lot of people will uh, now it also depends on what's going to happen with the this the COVID variant because if the variant starts to really become a problem um then i think that the conventions could be thin there could be, there won't be a lot of people going I think people will be concerned. Um, and I think that the dealers, like you said, the dealers will spend the money for the tables and their booth, but they won't get the return that they were thinking about. Um, and that'll happen that, that, you know, we'll know that in the next 60, 90 days. Um, I sure did hope you, people go back. Did you even think that, that dealers, let's say they, they have a profitable rate of return. Do you think that, it, 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 let's say they're expecting to get a 40% rate of return and they get a 25% rate of return, that's also going to be impactful because there is a point where you're profitable, but you're not business profitable. Meaning that if I sold the book, and I'm going to use an example, if I sold a book that eBass that, that was damaged, I wasn't business profitable on it, but I got rid of a toxic asset. And, okay. and so I didn't lose money. I didn't lose money and I made $5, but I can't be selling books to only make a five dollar profit if that makes any sense on every single book i i, I have to make more than that it, it's not worth my time for five bucks but i got rid of a bad asset and i didn't lose money on the deal um but the effort was was way more so do you think that that's also going to be a bigger issue because obviously if i'm a dealer and i'm expecting to do 40 percent, and i have a staff that i'm paying for for the day and that 25 percent we make pays for our mentor but just pays for my staff and maybe we have 50 bucks left over for the shop, that's not gonna pay the electricity bill, you know? Well, I, I think a lot of dealers, okay, so to answer your question, um, I'm not, I think that a lot of dealers are going to be anxious to do the shows because they want the visibility again, they want the exposure, uh, they wanna be, they wanna meet their customer. A lot of them have customers it comes specifically to see them at the shows and they like the, the customers also like to come and handle the book, see the book. So in the beginning, I think they're going to get that traffic through that they really, you know, were hoping to get, but I think depending on what happens with the, the COVID virus uh, and, and maybe, you know, if rates start to slow down across the country, 
people will come back to the shows. People are looking forward to getting out of the house. I, I agree. I, I agree. And we said, I think that look, look at, look at Black Widow. People are super excited about this movie and people are just saying, I'm glad I'm back in the theaters now, finally. And so I'm, I'm excited to go see it. I'm probably going to go see it next week or the week after. I just let all the cool people go ahead of me. And then and the movie's dead in like the middle of the week. It's, it's phenomenal. It's the best way how to have go see a movie. Is at like eleven o'clock on a Wednesday. It's, been, it's it's the greatest way. It's like it's like the old person way. There's like four people, and you're like, oh my god, this is what like being around people's not like. Oh, it's phenomenal. Um, I but, just but, saw it with my I saw it with my son opening night. We were excited to go. We got the IMAX tickets at AMC, and it was a blast. Did they give you a free comic with it? They did. They did. I was tempted to go, but I'm like, oh, I don't know where going. I got enough stuff to do. Instead, I, I watched you. wrestling. It was, it, was, it was much better. Yeah, it's it's a it was a fun movie to see. It was a good movie. My son was a little disappointed in it. Um, I enjoyed it because I like the character and Scarlett Johansson's easy to look at on film. Was- <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I I I I. I Think, think, think. I mean, my, my view on this, and we might disagree, is that I think it's going to be a rough fucking road out of cons. And, and I know a lot of people, and I know a lot of, you know, this is a big discussion in indie comics where people are saying, you know, I'm reevaluating my 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 position, you know, of going to a con where, you know, maybe as an indie content creator, I now, or even as an indie publisher, you know, it's it's a lot of work. And, okay, and, for those guys, yeah, for those guys that are are like the indie comic book uh, publisher or some of the artists, I think they're going to be thinking twice about it. And, and, and I even think to, to some degree with certain like people like New York Comic Con, Midtown Comics. I mean, Midtown Comics is one of like the big four major comic shops in New York. And, and, and I get that they have to be there. But if we looked at San Diego, uh, Miles High Comics, I think it was, basically said, hey, we're not going. After 46 years of being here, it was getting too expensive as it is. And, you know, I think that there's a changing in the guard because I think that people can do a hell of a lot more on the internet. And and also, I think the power of live sales are very, very interesting. And I also think the idea that if you have a high-end customer anyway, if you're selling me a $30,000 book, that sale's not happening over the internet. At least for me, it's not. not uh, I'm gonna, you're saying not over the internet it's not going to happen? Or you're saying it's... I, it I don't... I, for, for, for me, I'm going to do that deal in person. Yeah. That's just that's just me. You know, if it's a graded book, that's a different discussion. Because a graded book is set in stone. But if it's a raw, you know, book, and 30000 for a raw book might be high. But if it's, you know, you know, cap one and it's like the only raw one left or it's a raw Superman, it's like an 800,000 action one book, chances are I'm going to want to take a look at it before I go buy. And I think most of those deals do not happen on a blind eye. Right. So that, that's how I view it. And so, so I, I mean, look, I think cons are eventually going to come back. I think everybody needs to some degree say, OK, we've had viruses. We have masks. People are vaccinated. We shouldn't just jump into the fire and say, fuck it. But I think at some point, everybody has to go back to living their life. And, and, and I think, I think, I think, you know, there, there's always been risks with cons. It's just that COVID has exposed those risks. Good point. That's a very good point. I, I, I think I would agree with you about that. I think, you, that, yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm gonna, after, I think tomorrow, I'm going to reach out to a couple of my buddies that are comic book dealers. And ask them if they're gonna if they plan on doing the shows in the fall. I, I would love I would love to, to to know it. I also think that that also I think goes to this idea of how healthy are certain people's businesses. Because if you just got your ass kicked for the last eighteen months in your comic shop and you're hanging on by a thread, you might not have the thousand dollars even by a table. And so it might also be that might be a, an issue as well, where you may not just have the financial means to do it. And it's not that you're against doing it. It's the idea that, you know, you just might say, Hey, look, you know, we got to stabilize the business first and foremost and me coming out of the shop because 
if you're a comic shop dealer and you only have a staff of three, it's you, your wife, and then you have somebody part time, you know, and you need you and your part time worker want to go and, you know, your wife doesn't want to work on Saturday. Maybe you say, hey, I can't this round take Saturday yeah. off yeah. because we've had such a beat up year that I can't leave the shop and I can't send the other two people because it's a three man job. Versus the idea that every, you know, it's it's been a better time, like 2019. So I think there's a lot of stuff that that is depending on. And also, I'm just super curious how all this is going to work out. Just because I have no idea. I haven't been to a con in forever. And I'm sitting this year out. Yeah. I think that, I think that's, um, I think a lot of people are going to be feeling the same way you feel. But I think I mean, there's also another group. I think another group of people are going to be anxious to get out. Um, I, for one, would like to go. Yeah, you know what it is? I don't know. I would like to go to a small show. I would like to go to a show that has, like, maybe, like, 1,500 people just to test the water. And go don't to, or even those in Connecticut? Don't they have those in Connecticut? I don't even, I don't even know in which, it, like, like I'm, I'm new. I've only been here for about seven months, and I haven't oh, really looked okay. into it. So, so I've only been here for, for seven months, and I got, like, 30 other things going on in my life. And, and so, 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 so in my defense, I am uneducated in the con world. Um, I'm not against it. It's just that I'm uneducated in that sector right now because I just moved back. Which, which, um, and the only thing I know is New York Comic Con. And I already sort of wrote this year off. Um, and my eBay stuff is going really well. And then what I've learned is you don't tamper with things that work when it's working. It's kind of no. like you, you, you don't fix your car's engine. We, until it's broken. We need, so what do you on eBay? What's the name? You you have what's your handle for eBay? It's Pop Anime Comics Collectibles. Okay, and do you have a shop on eBay? So I don't have a shop, as in as in an eBay shop, but I am allowed to list ninety items, and I'm allowed to list up to nine thousand a month. And I'm allowed to list ninety items a month. I only have seventy, and it's more than plenty if I don't have to pay a fee. Eventually, I will get a shop, but until I need it, I'm not going to because, you know, if if you list and you're selling through 90 comics a month, that's a lot. That um, is and, 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 and I know people who have shops, and the only reason why they have a shop is they're selling a $7,000 book or a $30,000 book, and you need a shop on that. Um, my items, the most expensive item I have listed um, right now is $270. And it's three Pop Funkos. Uh, the most expensive comic that I sold was $400. So I prefer to deal with, because what I'm looking for in my eBay business is I want to generate anywhere from six to $1,000 a month. Because this is not going to be my full-time job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to eventually... What do you yeah, need to ask you? My next question is, what do you want to do? Oh, I, I'm not too sure yet. I, I want to run the world. I want to be president. No, it's 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 it's... Be, 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 being president seems like the worst job for me. I would love I to be. A I would agree. With, I would agree with you there. The best job in the United States is being a Supreme Court justice. That is the greatest job in the U.S. Um, because you're there for life, and nobody can really do anything unless you commit a crime. Right. It's the greatest job, and being the chief. I've justice. never heard that before. I've heard a lot of people tell me they want to be an acting. They want to be. Uh, want to be a Supreme know. Court justice. Okay. Right, right. Are you are you a law are you a, a law school student or would you I'm not a lawyer. It's that or, or I want to obviously run run you know you know business or or, or really, really what, what, what my background is is that I used to work for VSOs which are veteran service organizations for those who are out there and know that and I used to work for the VFW and then I worked for Student Veterans which is a veteran GI education group and so I have a very good understanding of the education system. And I would love to work in consumer affairs on education issues and, you know, grants and all that stuff. And I would love to be the guy to mastermind a, a big piece of legislation that would solve all of that. And what's, uh, so what's getting in the way of that? I, I live in a state that's not government. <laughs> that, that's the problem. And also, also, you know, you know, there, there's a lot of other stuff going on that I don't want to get too much into the detail with where okay. uh, I'm, I'm fixing my life and also... I used to live in D.C. and there's no jobs there. And I'm seeing what Connecticut has to offer. And uh, who knows where I'm going to go with, with all of this stuff. But obviously, I'm going to want to probably doing something interesting in my life. 
But again, my entire point of my eBay business is to legitly just produce excess cash that allows me to invest more. And and, and I'm not looking to, to you know make millions and millions of dollars. My expectations are very low. But my goal is to make anywhere from 500 to about $1,000 in profit, which obviously means that I want to sell anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 every month and take that money and then you invest it. And then just it's used as an accelerant for me. And I get to do something fun and I get to pick up cool merch, throw it on my Instagram, hold on to it for a little while. And then I also get to, you know, deliver good items to customers and they're happy about it. Your show is a great, I mean, you've been doing the show now for how long? Which which show? Because I have like three. The show that we're on. Oh, so I've been doing I've been doing this since uh, pretty much January when I can. So I've been doing this show since January, and this is my third show. And I maybe do two three videos of just doing commentary uh -huh. um, on on stuff, and then I do interview stuff like this. Um, and then my other show that that I'm doing, which is super super interesting, is um, conversations in pop culture, and I do four a week on that. And that's interviewing people in the indie comic realm, voice actors, wrestlers, cosplayers. And then I have the first show, which is a podcast, which is similar, but more of mainstream people versus less mainstream people. So obviously I'm all over the place and I'm eventually building the entire class of comic book investing. I want to get you uh, uh, to do an interview with a buddy of mine who is one of the partners at Metropolis Comics. Uh, in New York City, these is guys. It, it, these guys are the real deal. Is, is it uh, Mr. Superman? Yeah, Vince, Vinny. I, I we I was trying. I reached out to him actually, of all things, and 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 because 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 if if there's ever ever an interview to do, that this would be it. Because because he he's like the, the mainstream and uh, all, all the good stories, and uh, I would love that that interview. He's That'd be fun, He's a fun guy. He's he's. Uh, and he, he he likes to talk to everybody, so I don't think that would be a problem. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna make it happen. How's that? Oh man, oh man. I I, I would say something very inappropriately. So 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 I'm just gonna say Wolf of Wall Street, and uh, there's a scene in the Wolf of Wall Street where uh, somebody says something to Jordan, and uh, it's, it's a great scene when he sells a penny stock and he gets his first fifty percent commission of like four grand. So 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 I'm gonna leave it at that to to, okay. to be. It, it, I don't know, you've seen the Wolf of Wall Street, right? I saw Did, it. I, I don't remember the exact scene, <laughs> you, but I can only imagine. It, it's the say? scene. It's, it? the, it's it's the scene in, in, in the investing center, and uh, what 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 he says is that. Uh, so you're telling me that uh, if I sell, you know, this, um, that, that if I sell ten thousand dollars, I think it is. And I'm going to get a $5,000 commission. And then the guy who hires her says, if you do that, I will personally give you a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> and and, 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 and it's, it's, a, it's a great scene. It's a funny scene. And then you just hear Jordan like, like five minutes later selling. Say, I got this great stock. It's the cutting edge technology. And obviously he was being facetious, the, the thing. But but it, it, it just gets the point across instantly. So, so, so that, that's what I was like. Oh, it's, it's, it's great. But. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to work on that for you. Seriously, I, I, I'm going to make this happen. No, no, no. I, I absolutely appreciate it because because he he is the the standard, and, and obviously, I mean, I would love to to, to have have an interview with him because because it's kind of like the the gold thing. But but where, where I'm going with this as as an individual, uh, for for those who know, and, and I've said it so many times, and everybody who watches this understands that um, I'm building out the class, and and unlike all the people who are doing you know, the top 10 list or talking about the advanced stuff, which is all good. And I don't want to stop anyone from watching a top 10 list or anything like that, even though I'm not a big fan of them. Where I'm going with this is I want to teach research. And so my class is actually broken into four modules, which it's research, budgeting, and how to build budgets, um, grading, and then exits. And the whole point of the class is to give a very basic understanding of where we're going. And that's where sort of my, I guess, fourth, you know, income stream is going because I think people need to know the basics and I think people need to be reminded of the basics on how to do research, how to understand certain things. And I'm not too sure how much I'm charging for the class. I'm not sure where it's going to be, but building a class is complicated and I don't do anything half-assed. So 
It's going to be okay. Is, and so this is going to be for comic book collectors? Um, it's going to be for comic book collectors and investors. investors. Right. And it, because because the thing is that it's it's a skills based class, meaning that I'm not telling you what to, to, to buy, but I'm telling you how to do your research on a comic book. And you notice it is important to understand how to do your research on a comic book. It's important for you to understand that there's budgeting. You need to know how to build a budget. I am beyond intentional. When I, when I went to a con, my last con that I went to, I went in there with a thousand dollars and every dollar had a mission that day. There was no ATM machine. I laugh at people who go to an ATM machine at cons. I mock them. And, and, and I thoroughly want to continue to mock them. And I want to make them all feel horrific when you're on an ATM machine at a convention. Because it means that you didn't plan your money correctly. Correct. It means that you are giving away 3% for 80% of them because that ATM is probably some obscure ATM that nobody banks at. Well, what about credit cards? Don't a lot of people pay with credit cards too? And that means they're paying 18 to 20% more. When you use a credit card, you pay and you spend more money. Very you few spend people. More money. Yeah, I just, I don't know if I agree with the fact that you're, because a lot of people would pay their bill off right away. They take, they would take, they would take a credit card with them. What, what it is, is that it's the mentality mm -hmm. where you, when, when, when you pay in cash. So, 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 so I, Go and I paid for everything in cash that day. So because now you know it's set, because it's a set amount, you're not going to spend more. And, than that. And every time I bought an autograph for a hundred dollars or I did some grading, my wallet got lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And I was happy to do it. Also, I knew I wasn't going to get a bill the next day or and be like, holy fuck, I spent seven hundred dollars. How the fuck did I do that? But it also creates pain and it makes you think about what you're doing. It makes you drop all the stupid shit you can buy at a con. There's a lot of fun stuff you can buy at a con. And I'm all for people, if you wanna spend your money on whatever you wanna spend your money on, that's great. But I know people who spent $300 on something, like, why did I buy this? This is not useful. This is not. Collects, you bring it home and it collects dust on the shelf. So when, when I assigned a dollar to everything, what starts happening is that you say, okay, this is not in the mission plan. Now, I bought a lot of stuff. I got a commission. I got a bunch of graded stuff. I got two Pop Funkos that I didn't know were there, but I had that budgeted. I had a fun $100 fun category, a stupid shit category. Okay, so, so, so everything was, was intentional. And when you use a credit card, it's an impulse thing, and that's where your 18% more spending comes out of. And there's been studies on this where because there's no pain receptor being granted when you use a credit card. There is no pain, they've measured this. And there's been so many studies where there's no pain with a credit card. Right, and, and actually, there's probably more dopamine involved. It, it, it's, it, 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 I don't know, probably, I, I, I would tend I mean, to think. You know, you're, you're taking up plastic and you're feeling good about spending the money. <laughs> if it, I'll, give, I'll give an example and I'm not gonna tell you, and I'm gonna ask you your opinion on this. So, you, you're a merchant. I hand you my credit card. You process it. You give me my credit card back, right? Isn't that a little weird? Weird in what respect? I so I'll modify it slightly. I have a comic. You're the seller. I'm the buyer. I bring the comic to you. Say, okay, it's what this. I hand you my credit card. I then take the comic and my credit card back. Oh, you. You're saying you're taking a product, you're taking merchandise away. I theoretically get paid well, electronically. So, so what I'm saying is that with cash, I walk up all happy. I hand you a 20. The book is 15. You hand me a five back in the merchandise. And it's significantly less than what I had before. That is, that is, is an mental exchange where your brain commutes that. In a credit card transaction, your brain does not commute what was exchanged. You might well, you might know what was exchanged, but the, the, the whole point is that when, when you take that 20 and it gets broken, now you only have five left, but you have the merchandise, you understand what, what happened. Yes, yes, I agree. You, you, you um, it's more um, visual and not as theoretical. 
And so, and so if you're a collector and you want to go out and you have no desire to sell, credit card be my guest. If you're an investor like me, I use cash, not because I like Dave Ramsey. I love Dave Ramsey, but I use cash because A, it doesn't bite me in the ass and it forces me to be intentional with my actions and not I anything else. That. Sure. I see your point. And, and, and look, you know, you know, I use a credit card all the time to buy stuff and I pay it immediately. And like I'm saying to these companies, can you process it faster for me? Like I want instant processing because I'm like, guys, you don't understand. Like I, and I've actually prepaid my bill before, which you can do. I didn't know you could do that. And then I was like, yeah, you could do that. I'm like, this is fantastic. So I prepaid my bill once because I knew I had an $800 bill coming and I prepaid $800 of it. So that the second that bill hit, it was paid off. Because I, I got charged once a late fee of a dollar. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a little crazy. I'm a little crazy. But I'm making money, right? And so and so 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 so, so that that's where I stand on things. But but I I I really enjoyed. Our, I I I got to so scoot. Gotta absolutely. Scoot. So so before you do, obviously, I want to give you a chance to promote yourself. So obviously, you got a bunch of stuff going on. I don't know what you do per, per se. I think you're involved in a lot of different things. So what do you want to promote? <laughs> um, or or, or like, tell the haters something that that's cool too. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, so what I do now is I'm an executive coach. So I work with people, mostly um, entrepreneurs and businesses, and it can be or organizations. Uh, I enjoy doing executive coaching uh, and I coach leaders. So I work, I work with people that are leading other people. To me, that's the greatest enjoyment for me. Um, it, I'm passionate about it. Uh, I feel like I, I can give a lot of, of my knowledge and wisdom and I can see, I can see the results in what I do. So my coaching is my current gig is what I do. And, and, and what, what is your company if you would like to say in case we want to go find you and their leaders and obviously people are trying to elevate themselves up? I, I, I don't have a website. I usually, all of my coaching is through word of mouth. So if people want to look me up, it's Thomas Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. I can give you my email. They can email me or um, they can, you know, I don't want to put my phone number out there, but if they want to email me, they can email me at fishpaul3739 at gmail.com. F-I-S-H-P-A-U-L 3739 at gmail.com. Well, I, I will say this and I'm going to let you go is that obviously if you are an executive, if you're in a C-level suite and you're leading a team or you're a manager or something of any of that, obviously coaching it can be very helpful. And a little coaching can go a long way and a lot of coaching can go a long way. So obviously having coaches, it can be very helpful. Having mentors is very helpful. And you don't know what you don't know until somebody tells you and then you're like, oh man, this could change my entire business. And Good, good, good leaders are are built in a lot of ways and good leaders need to be serviced and coaches do that in a lot of ways. And hopefully that wasn't too sexual. And so on that note, I appreciate you coming on because because obviously people don't come on. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. And obviously I had a lot of fun. So I'm going to let you go because I got to go write another interview now about something that might be 420 oriented. So hopefully that'll be good and I appreciate you coming on. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.